This is a special report from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for joining us. We're now going to take you to the Idaho courtroom where Judge John Judge is conducting a motions hearing in regards to the case against Brian Koberger and the murder of the four college students and the University of Idaho campus in 2020. Two. Let's go there right now. Bill Thompson, Ashley Jennings, Jeff Nye, and Ingrid Beatty. Um, the proceedings, I hope, I think they are, are live streaming through the court's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so please do not attempt to record, film, or transmit uh, during the proceedings. Thank you for that. All right, so we have uh, some motions uh, to address today, uh, and I thought we should first go with the defendant's motion to allow experts and investigators access to view IgG information, if, if that makes uh, sense. I think also the motion to clarify sealed order for disclosure of IgG and merges into that. So go ahead, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Your Honor, reading the state's response, I think the state has no objection to the three named experts having access to the sealed IgG materials or the materials subject to protective order. So I think what we're really talking about is our investigative team for Brian's case to have access to the IgG materials. And the state has objected to that. They've objected in part because they are not named in our motion. So I want to address that first. Your Honor, they are not named, and I can name them, that's not a problem, but the reason I didn't is based on consistency. These same investigators have had access to the grand jury materials to assist us in the case. They've had access to other things subject to protective order, and they're not named in those. They have access, those three, there's three items subject to other protective order, and that's medical information from hospitals, that's University of Idaho records, and most recently, police procedures. They haven't been required to be named in orders in any of those. And so for consistency, I did the same thing. But we can name them if that is a sticking point. I would note that the members of the FBI that did the analysis are not named in the materials either. Your Honor, the reason why our investigators are important to have access to the IgG, IgG materials is because of the kind of case this is and the kind of investigation that we're required to launch in the case. We have to have investigators on a death penalty case, and we have them. These materials or these items in the IgG binder, those are things that we may end up filing motions in court. In order to prepare for those, we rely on our investigators to help us with side tasks, with big tasks, with all of the tasks. We would need to utilize our experts. If our investigators can't have access to the materials, they'll have to be shut out of those meetings with those experts, and they'll have to be shut out of court proceedings that we might launch related to those materials. Your Honor, to meet our constitutional duties, in Brian's case, his rights to have effective assistance of counsel, to have a full investigation, to have a fair trial, we have to have investigators. Those investigators are on board and have been on board, and they help us understand things that are given to us by the state. They help us find witnesses, they help us find experts, and they're necessary to be part of the conversation of what the IgG materials are and what they mean. This matters in figuring out how Mr. Koberger ends up on the police radar and subject to these proceedings here. I know we've talked about this before and I still don't have all of those answers. I believe today with our experts getting access, we're gonna make some headway with that, but we also need our investigators to be part of those discussions as well. Again, Your Honor, if their names appearing in a court order is an issue, that we'll do that, we'll do that. That's inconsistent with the other protective orders, but we'll do that. And they'll be subject to the protective order just like we are, and they'll abide by it 
just like they've done for the other protected materials they've had access to. And while we're on that line, if the court wants me to talk about the clarification, I can do that. Let's let's, uh, let's hear for, from the state first. I, I mean, I understand the uh, having investigators. I think what we're talking about, though, is just with the IgG, that we have to be especially careful about you know, who's going to have the access, uh, what they're going to do with it. Uh, I think uh, I agree. Um, it's clear that the state has no objection to the uh, three experts that you've named. Uh, so I don't think that's a problem. But let me go to what is Ms. Dennings. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, that's correct, Your Honor. And Your Honor is familiar and aware of the materials that we're discussing, and you're also aware uh, of the sensitive nature of those materials. The state is really just following the court's lead in your protective order, where you named specifically who on the defense team would be allowed to have access. It follows that if we're going to expand that access, that those individuals need to be specifically named. And it's really going to be the only way the court can have control of any unauthorized dissemination, is to know exactly who was given what was privy to what was enclosed. So at a bare minimum, we need to know who it's going to be who it's going to be given over to. Um, your December 29th sealed order also said that um, any further dissemination of the materials or the information contained within the materials, including to any investigator or experts, must be approved by the court after a showing by the defense as to why such individual needs the information. Um, in the defense's motion, their stated reasoning is, quote, to investigate how and when Mr. Koberger was identified as a suspect, end quote. State maintains they don't need access to all of that highly sensitive information. Um, to satisfy that purpose that is laid out in the November 28, 2023 letter from the FBI to the state. So we'd be, we would ask that, one, they be named, if they are granted access, that it be to that letter, um, and that the balance of the materials be protected. And we would ask that you follow the proposed language in the state's response from February 9th um, to ensure further protections of the materials. Thank you, Ms. James. Sailor? <clears throat> well, Your Honor, I, I know what letter Ms. Jennings refers to, and I think our experts should have access to the actual materials. That letter is a summary. It's a police summary. Our duty is to investigate police work. We do that in every case. And with our heightened duties in a death penalty case, our investigators should have access to the entire record. Our investigators understand what a protective order is, and they'll abide by that protective order. Again, if you want them named in any order allowing them access, that's fine. That's just fine with me. It's most important that they have access to all of the materials. The summary contained in the FBI's letter isn't the totality of the materials. It doesn't show some of the particulars about things that were happening on certain dates. And that's what's important to put into a timeline so that we can try to understand how the state did its work in this case. Well... One of the issues with this IGP is relevance at all. Um, and so the way I'm viewing it is maybe it needs to uh, go on steps, maybe where it's justified uh, with the relevance or the potential of relevance for some of that information. Because from the very beginning, uh, the state's position has been it has no bearing on the case. It will not have any bearing on the trial. But I allowed the access to uh, what I thought was potentially relevant uh, and to allow your experts, now allowing your experts to do that information. So let me just kind of move into the other um, clarification, because I also understand, particularly uh, relevance um, mitigation, 
okay, what the, what your um, investigators need to cover. They likely have to uh, have contact with Mr. Koglinger's family, and that we're not we're not. I don't think we're talking about that kind of. Uh, investigation. I mean, that's that is your responsibility. It's also your responsibility to dig in wherever you wherever you have have to have to. I mean, I think you're required to do that. So, my um, balancing responsibility is to keep it in control to some degree. So I guess I, I what I'm asking is that I have some justification uh, for making contact with certain families that may have no bearing whatsoever on the case, unless it's in mitigation or something like that. Now, the DNA issues, especially I mean maybe especially in the IGG. It has to have some relevance if there's some um, context, okay, that connects to the case itself. That's how I'm looking at it. I might be wrong, but so you can respond. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> We're talking about a couple of different things now. With our request for clarification, I was talking specifically about people that are already known to our team that we may be in contact with, friends, direct family, parents, sisters, uh, aunts and uncles. And Those can are, I interrupt you just for one sure. second? That, that has no re relevance to the IgG information that you were, you were given. There's no. Those are people we already knew before. Okay. Um, so I want clarification that I can continue to talk to the Coburger family. Yes, I, I want to make sure I'm not running afoul of court order. I, I and again, I, I want to be appropriate. I want to be really clear who I'm asking for to have access to the IGGs. It's not our mitigation investigator. That our mitigation investigator, I think the court heard me talk about going three gen generations back to do her work. That's required under under the ABN. I'm not talking about her. She wouldn't have access to this. I'm talking about our criminal investigators dealing with the innocent space for Brian. Those are the people that I think should have access to the same materials under the same protective order. They're not doing the generations back. None of the IgG materials would be used for that part of the mitigation work. She's doing her own thing, her mitigation investigator, uh, looking backwards as she's supposed to at the things she needs to. That's not the IgG material. So putting aside that investigator and thinking of only our criminal investigators that are going to be dealing with our innocent space of the case, those are the investigators that I'd like to have access. They're the investigators that participate in the meeting with our experts. They're the investigators that help us put the timeline together to understand different things that were happening in the case before Brian's name was ever spoken by anybody, and we're missing that big piece about why was Brian's name spoken and how, and how does that connect to the other pieces that we have. That's what our criminal investigators are going to do. They are not looking at IgG materials, if allowed, to do any of the mitigation work. That's separate and apart. So I, I want to make sure that that's really clear. Also, when we're talking about whether something is relevant or not, I think that we're thinking of the standard for information to come out in court. That's not what I'm talking about. The court found that the IgG information was material under the discovery rules to the defense and allowed us to have access to some. It's for that same purpose and under that same rule that we're asking the court to allow our investigators to have access to the same materials. Whether or not any of this is something that comes into the court uh, or into trial, that's a question to be answered later. I can see how, I think, this is why I'm really happy to have our experts involved, but I can see if a way that there may be a motion practice that happens that relates to this. I'm not there yet. That, but that's, that's where I am. 
And because because uh, I'm, I'm, if if you have these experts, okay, go through this. I've been through all the, this information, and so if you can go, you know, using your experts, and your experts kind of can tell me and state that uh, you need to investigate particular people, okay, that were involved in this, then we can have a hearing about it. But I'm not, I'm not quite ready to be convinced that without getting this information uh, from the experts that um, we're going to find some pathway, okay, that's going to be helpful to Mr. Co Coburn. If, I, I mean, since you're in the courtroom, so if that's what you want to do, we can. I'm... Um, I'm here. We waited a while to come to this hearing. I'm asking for it all with a protective order. If we do it the other way, we can do it. It's just everything takes time. And if that's the preference, that's okay. The court knows and would order us to not reach out to any of the people in this material, and we wouldn't do any of that. If we have a motion to file that references any of the content of the materials, that would be filed under seal. This, these are sealed items. If there was a hearing, I would guess the court would have a chance to look at the filings before granting me a hearing and hear from the state, and that would be sealed. I'm not asking our investigators have access to run out and start interviewing people. I'm asking they have access to not be shut out of conversations considering what this means and how our client came to the attention of law enforcement and to plug things into the timeline of us trying to understand how we got from November 13th to December 29th. That, that's it. Not to go out and try to talk to people. I can just see that there's a potential motion to be filed, but that wouldn't be contacting anybody at all. That would be a motion well, for the courts. That's to see. reassuring. I mean, that, that's one of the concerns. I mean, you know, pulling a lot of other people into the case that, uh, you know, are completely innocent and don't even have any connection uh, to the situation. So let me go back to Luke Jennings. Do you have any response to any of this? No, Your Honor. I'll just reiterate that uh, Ms. Taylor keeps discussing the their ability to just understand the timeline. Again, you're very familiar with the materials. Understanding the timeline and how we got from November 13th to December 29th, it all laid out in that letter. Um, none of the other materials are going to answer their questions regarding the timeline. So that's that they be given access to that, named investigators, to that letter. Thank you. You may rem remember a few hearings uh, in the past that the state, from the very beginning, said they, they, there was no, that played no uh, no I don't know how to how you it, it wasn't when I asked them in the hearing that did you use the IDG, uh, any of the information at the IDG to get the warrant uh, to get uh, Mr. O uh, Koberger's uh, DNA that was not part of it. So, in terms of the time frame, don't know that it's that complicated. Because a lot of what happened in the time in the time frame happened before that. Now, that's up to you um, to get to dig into that, obviously. But there was a lot of information in the letter, too. Just their sequence of uh, using the IGG uh, at all. So... We're going to have to sort this out, obviously. But um, going back to what I'd like to do is just get some justification for digging in deeper, uh, if necessary. And I'm not sure it's necessary, but you know, I, I'm going to keep an open mind about that. So, 
for right now, I would say, uh, let's just get your experts looking at the IgG stuff and exactly what they can read from that. And um, we'll go from there. Okay. Now, with regard to your clarification, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that you, your investigators can't contact people that they've already contacted uh, without relying on the IGT information. Does that work for now? Yes, Your Honor. I, I, our mitigation expert has done her own family tree based on her work. And she has nothing to do with the IgG material. She's not an expert that would have access to that. She's not named. So she needs to keep doing what she's doing as far as her work goes. And, and I think the proper clarification is that the IgG materials will not be used to develop any investigative leads. I think that's fair. And with uh, Ms. Jenny's uh, proposed in language, in their response to your motion. Um, is that something that you would object to at this point? I'm sure it, you probably read that language. I, I did read it. It was It's a little bit less straightforward, but I think it covers it. It allows me to continue to speak to the people I'm speaking to and that I need to speak to that are on my list. Okay. Um, anything else about that? No. These issues. Okay. Ms. Jennings? No, okay. okay, the next the next question I had is I know that uh, Mr. Koberger filed uh, for a permissive appeal to the Supreme Court, and I just wondered what you know about that because I have heard nothing about that. I know it was filed. I know the states filed their objection, and that's the last that I recall seeing about it. Yes. So, at this point, we don't know if the Supreme Court uh, is going to take it. Okay, we don't know. You know anything else, Mr. Mr. Thompson? Uh, not other than the state's response was filed by the appellate division of the Attorney General's office. I, I think we're just waiting to hear uh, from the Supreme Court at this point. Correct, Your Honor. Um, we're just waiting to hear from the Supreme Court. I can tell you there's no deadline in the rule for them. Uh, they didn't include a deadline for themselves. And in my experience, it can take anywhere from a couple weeks to a month or so. So at this point, we're just waiting to hear. So I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Uh, if it's filed, does that pause? What we need to do here, or do we just pause it only when they pick it up? Uh, my read of the rules, Your Honor, is, is the latter that we would we continue as we are uh, unless and until they decide to take it, and then they would decide at that point what exactly is paused and not paused. Okay, thank you. Anything else about that, Ms. Taylor? No, thank you, Chair. Mr. Thompson. No, sir. All right, I think we're now to. Schedule. Starting with, um, there was a request on change of venue, maybe late April, you were saying. Yes, Your Honor, um, either that last week of April, I think it starts the 29th and 30th, or the first or second week of May for the actual hearing is when we'd request. And we would ask that we have until maybe the second week of April to get our initial briefing in and then the state's response and our reply after that. So what are you thinking would be the, the hearing? Like, um, give me a day or a week. I would say that first full week of May, um, maybe that's May 5th or May 6th. All right, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Ms. Beatty, Ben, 
Right. Your, Your Honor, we're asking the court to either deny this motion for change of venue as premature or to set a hearing date closer to the trial date when that trial date gets set. And the reason for that is when courts look to change of venue and whether or not that's appropriate, uh, the courts look to affidavits that have been filed. Um, importantly, they look to uh, what jurors say, prospective jurors say during the voir dire process. Another thing that courts look to is the amount of media coverage and the proximity of that media coverage and the intensity of that media coverage to the trial. So in this case, uh, I, I think we, A, we don't have sufficient information to even determine whether or not that's appropriate without seeing what a prospective jurors actually say, but B, we're far enough out from trial that we can't really gauge that anyway. Uh, so we would ask, uh, we would ask the court to either deny that uh, motion at this time or to set a hearing uh, further down the road and closer to trial. If we do proceed to hearing, uh, the state would just ask for a scheduling order. At this point, uh, the defense has filed a motion. They did not file any affidavits, disclose any experts. They haven't even filed a supporting memorandum. And so we're not even sure what specific cases they're relying upon. So we can't really respond substantively to that motion until it's briefed. So we would ask the court to set a briefing schedule as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Well, my, my interpretation was that they were going to give us a lot of information, uh, affidavits, uh, maybe testimony uh, for the hearing. Is that right, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, you're right. The motion was to put everybody on notice that we'd like to have this addressed. We do intend to have a presentation for the court. We do intend to have briefing for the state. I anticipated we'd get that scheduled today. But no, I, I didn't file the motion. I filed it to put everybody on notice that it's coming, and I think we need to address it. I think we need to address it before a trial setting. It doesn't make sense to set a trial, get right up to it, and then have to have everybody who's under subpoena rescheduled and have to have the public and the families of everybody disappointed because we're going to reset it at the last minute. So I think we should take care of whether or not the court should change venue sooner rather than later, especially given the length that this trial is anticipated to go, we'll need to schedule a courtroom either here or in another county in Idaho. I mean, we'll need some advance notice to get that done. That it'll take a long time to try this case. Thank you, Ms. Beatty. Thank you, Ms. Beatty. And Your Honor, the state is asking for a briefing schedule so that we're not in a situation where the state is learning for the first time during a hearing um, what experts the defendant might be calling and what their arguments are, we would ask that all of that information be disclosed prior to hearing, including the CVs of any experts that will be testifying. Well, that's certainly what I would expect. But this it, it's quite sticky, right, to think, you know, you're going to wait until uh, ready to seating the, the jury, which is probably a two-week process in this case, um, and then figure out, hey, we can't find, we can't see the jury, so we have to move the trial. Um, at the same time, how do you really know if there's if some prejudice um, without trying to see the jury? It's really a catch-22. And all of the logistical concerns that Ms. Taylor is describing are totally correct. The problem is that is what the law requires, and that is what the case law says. The case law does contemplate that. So certainly it's correct to note that there, there are going to be logistical challenges to that, but that's that's what the case law requires. Um, but even if the court weren't inclined to wait until we're actually going through the more dire process, at a minimum, uh, I think it would be appropriate for the court to look to some jury questionnaires and, and at least go through that process. Okay. Um, was like, well, this morning I was looking at State versus Haddon, where there that was, you're probably very familiar with that, but um, that's Court of Appeals case, uh, 2012, I believe. And uh, there was a um, request to change venue well before the trial. Uh, the judge denied that. And then um, it came up again when they were trying to seat the jury, and then the judge uh, denied that at that point. But um, kind of a double step to figure out if 
uh, it was necessary. I've been struggling with this, you know, for about well, months, and so it's hard to know. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that one of the parties can't uh, present evidence, um, and the standard is kind of squishy, in my opinion, but um, they can provide that kind of information well before the trial. At the same time, I want to make sure that the state has the opportunity to respond to whatever information uh, the, the Mr. Kohlberger is going to present. So, so now I'm scratching my head about, well, is May, first uh, week of May, is that, does that allow enough time? Is that, does that allow it enough time for you, Ms. Taylor? Your Honor, I think it does. I can present the information uh, to the state. I can have my briefing and I can have affidavits and let them know of any witness that I want to call. I can do that probably by the beginning of the second week of April. And that would give them, if we do this in May, that would give them ample time to read it over and respond to what we intend to present. Thank you. Ms. Bay, what are your thoughts? Your Honor, as far as the duration of time between the briefing and the hearing, the state has no concerns about that. The state would just have concerns about those factors um, that the court that the courts require us to look to um, as far as time the timing of the hearing um, compared to the timing of trial. Um, but as far as as far as a, a briefing schedule prior to the hearing itself, that timeline makes sense to the state. Well, let's let's explore that just for a moment. Uh, because I've been thinking about the setting of trial, um, well, also for months, but I listened very carefully to Ms. Taylor and Mr. Thompson in our last hearing, and uh, I really it wasn't clear that I'm not really happy about sending, setting the, top, the uh, trial in 2025. It seems so far away. Now, it's not just, uh, doesn't just affect Mr. Koberger and his defense, but there's a lot of other considerations. So I am trying to be fair um, and realistic okay, about when we could really be ready for trial. Now we want to do it once, okay? So um, let me go first to you, Mr. Thompson, about when, I know that it's been complicated, the discovery. I mean, you have these different agencies, FBI, state police, uh, the state lab, We've got uh, Moscow Police Department, Latah County, Pullman Law Enforcement, Pennsylvania Law, uh, law Enforcement. Um, and I think you mentioned there's, it's hard to get all this stuff together. Um, and that is one of the things that has delayed uh, setting the trial, uh, not to mention the motions about the grand jury procedures, uh, also the issues about the investigative uh, genetic genealogy issues, and um, I'm kind of curious, okay, when do you think that you will be completely finished with providing discovery to the defense? Uh, Judge, most current um, projection that we have would probably be at the end of the summer. Um, the majority of the discovery has been provided. That's not to say that Mr. Koberger has been able to, and his defense team, been able to digest it all because it is substantial as an understatement. Uh, we are still awaiting my information that uh, the defense both wants and uh, and needs to have. And we, we're going back through all the discovery to make sure that nothing has been overlooked. We have two members of our team, an attorney and a legal assistant, who are essentially assigned full time to that task. Um, and that's that's projecting we got from them. It could be up to six months. 
which would put us with uh, discovery, initial discovery completion at the end of August, 1st of September of this year. Because well, last time you were talking about uh, August for the trial. Sure enough. And that's what we had hoped for. And when we filed our motion for uh, trial setting scheduler back in December, a couple months ago, we felt that was realistic. And as we are looking at where we are right now, I'm not sure that it is. Um, we know that the defense has already indicated that just on the death penalty alone, they will be filing multiple motions, many of them very lengthy. We've seen the same filings in the Nez Perce County homicide case that recently resolved. Um, those I could see taking a couple months in and of themselves to address, uh, in addition to uh, motions that actually directly relate to the merits of this trial, discovery, motions of Lindy, and that sort of thing. Um, our team met again this morning um, with uh, our, our companions uh, from the chief's office here in Moscow, and we actually have a proposal to make to the court for a trial date and a scheduling order, if Your Honor is interested. I'm very interested. Uh, I'll tell you before you before you say anything about that, yes, I was, I was uh, looking at whether or not it was realistic and fair, okay, you know, being, trying to be compromising to some degree. Uh, I think it was uh, March 3rd, 2025. Well, Your Honor, it just happens to be in pink highlight on my ad here, March 3rd, 2025. Okay, I had no idea. I wasn't reading your mind or anything, but I thought that's about the mid. And I remember, Ms. Taylor, that you said that would be the soonest you could be ready. And that was if everything went right from that point. And I and remember it, that. And too. it hasn't. It hasn't. But I'll hear what their proposals are. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Judge. Um, so we would propose that the court set March 3rd of 2025 as the start of trial. We would propose a September 6, 2024 preliminary discovery deadline that would uh, include exhibits known at that time. November 8, 2024, for the defendant's discovery deadline, that would give them a chance to respond uh, to any last minute discovery uh, that comes out from the state. Um, February 7th of 2025 for the state uh, to uh, disclose any basically reply or rebuttal to what we've learned from the defense discovery. That would include rebuttal experts. Uh, the defense's dead wide line would also necessarily have to include their mitigation evidence. Um, we would suggest the court consider a final pretrial conference, kind of a D pretrial wrap up details conference for the week of February 12th to 16th, 2025. Since the death penalty related motions are already known and they aren't dependent on discovery, uh, we would ask that uh, any death penalty related motions defense have be filed by se September 6th of this year, that the state have until October 11th to re respond. The defense can then reply by October 25th and schedule a hearing during the week of November 4th through the 8th of this year. So we can get that wad of 12, 18, however many of, of those motions are gonna be filed, we can get that handled. We would suggest that the court direct the jury questionnaires, if we can't agree on one, that the record suggestions uh, from the state and the defense be to the court by November 1st of this year. That would give, give the court the opportunity to finalize a jury questionnaire that the court is comfortable with, and it can be ready at the start of the next calendar year, which is when the next jury pool would be pulled or would be drawn. Uh, and the court can, at that point, um, get questionnaires out to an initial panel and can assess in a timely fashion, um, are we really going to have venue issues um, in the early part of the next year as we approach March 3rd? Um, we propose the jury instructions exhibit list uh, be uh, exchanged by January 31st of 2025. And finally, as to pretrial motions, which would be case specific motions, motions in limine and those sorts of things, the deadline for filing that, that would be November 22nd of this year. 
with the understanding that parties could file them early. I mean, the state already has been developing a list of various pretrial motions in limine that we think we'd like the court to consider, and we could file those early. But the deadline would be uh, November 22nd, responses by December 13th, replies by December 20th, and then schedule a hearing on any of those pretrial motions sometime during the week of January 6th through the 10th. And I think you, you have to write that down. I, I have it all written down. We can, we can get, yes, sir. And we can get it to you in writing. That's not a problem. Okay. Ms. Taylor, so if things aren't going perfectly, but of course they never do. They never do, Judge. They never do. And I'll say it again. Death is different. This is a capital case. I've heard the court say the court only wants to do it once. And I've heard the court ask, what can I do to speed things up? I need discovery. I need all of the discovery. I need the things that we've asked for. I need to not have to fight in motions to compel for things that was done on behalf of the state by the FBI that ends up being used against Brian or used in the investigation. I need that stuff. I need, when I ask for something, I need to get it rather than have to go back and ask and ask and ask again. And I'm not saying anything mean about Bill Thompson. I'm just not. I think he tries his very best, but I think he's hampered by the agencies and the information he gets from them. I can give you some examples. We asked for x-rays. We were told they don't exist. They're listed repeatedly in reports. We asked for them again. And I'm not sure if I'm getting them or not. The response is, we have thumbnails, but we haven't found the actual extras. There's one example. I asked for certain mapping data done by a member of the cast team. They said, you have it all. I said, no, I don't. I only have November 29th. And they said, oh, well, I guess we just didn't get that. Something didn't copyright. And I'm not saying anything mean about Bill or his office. I'm saying this is really difficult to drag the information out and get it, get it to my experts or to understand it. And to hear that we're gonna have a discovery deadline by the end of August is great. I need to have every piece of everything. I then have to have time to double check and make sure I really got it. I need to have time to get it to my experts and for them to have an opportunity to understand how that impacts their opinions, if at all. So I'm prepared for this case. And then we need time to get things to the state and for them to respond to what we send to them too. I know that this court wants to set this trial. These kinds of cases don't happen in a year. They don't happen in two years. They take a long time. This case is challenged with the way discovery has come at us. I'll give you another example. I open up, I get them, and I list them in my computer by date. At one point, I gave the court a printout of that so the court could see how I'm getting it. And when I look in a folder, it has subfolders. And I might get some reports from Moscow Police Department with an FBI report. And an FBI report might reference an email. It might reference a photograph. It might reference a screenshot of a picture or of a phone that they took when they interviewed somebody. That's not with it. So maybe a few months later, I get some photos that has these screenshots in. And now I have to try to figure out who gave that screenshot, whose phone did that come from, which officer did that interview, and get them matched up and figure out if it's somebody I need to talk to. So not only do we have a huge volume of information, the way I get it is completely disorganized. And it's like if you wanted to play 52 card pickup with 100,000 decks of cards and throw them in the air, and I have to go figure out how to put them together. And by the way, the backs of every one of those cards look the same. That's what I'm doing. We also have science questions in this case. We have DNA. We have cell phone analysis. We have video analysis. The video analysis that the state really likes in this case, I don't have the full scope of that video with audio that should be available. They're working on it. They really are. I don't think they're not working. I'm just saying this is a real thing that takes time. And then you have the public nature of this case and people don't want to talk to us. They're not wanting to talk to us. So we have to try to get witnesses, people that are listed in the state's discovery to talk to us. We have our duties 
that are required with mitigation because there's no break. I don't get to go to trial on the innocence phase and then if something goes wrong and Brian's not acquitted, I don't get time to go prepare that mitigation. That mitigation. I have to take another breath and start right there. So I have to have time to do all of that. Our mitigation expert is working as quickly as she can. She is meeting a lot of resistance to collect records and to conduct interviews. We're working through that as best we can. She has travel obligations to try to interview people. These things take time. I want all the discovery by the end of August. I love the discovery deadline by September 6th. That does not allow me enough time to get ready for trial by March 3rd. That deadline, that cutoff for us to get mitigation materials, that, that's impossible. That's just impossible. We've got the year pretty well scheduled out with what travel still needs to happen and what records still need to be obtained. So to have to have that to the state, I think they said by September, October, that that's just impossible. I would request that this court take up our venue motion in May, make a decision on venue, and let's see where we can get with the discovery. I still need to read every bit of discovery that's come, and I haven't. I scan it when I get it, but to go page by page and read it and understand what it means, I'm not through 2023. I have a long ways to go. So I don't think that that is realistic to set it. I think if you set it for March, I'm going to be back here after the discovery deadline, and I'm going to be telling you there's no way that we're going to be ready for trial. I would rather this court set the change of venue, make that determination. Let's see where we get with the discovery by May. Probably the court would have a decision by the end of May, early June. Let's see where we are with discovery by then and set a realistic day. I hope we can go by summer of 2025. Well, thank you, Ms. Taylor. I, um, I can help in any way to speed things uh, with, you know, if there's problems with discovery, I'm happy to do that on very short notice, you know, just so that we can keep going. Um, but you say, you know, it would be fantastic if uh, you got all the, all the discovery by August. Your mitigation person has been working already, right? Um, and just to know that I'm not being insensitive about this, I did. I did. I did read the uh, ABA supplementary uh, supplementary uh, guidelines for mitigation fun um, function of defense teams in death penalty cases, and it's it's huge. Okay, I I get it. There there are so many things. Um, that if you don't do, then it comes back as, well, you were ineffective. And uh, those standards are, are high standards, for sure. And it takes, obviously, it takes a lot of time. So, but I'm also thinking, if you get all the discovery, if you can, assuming that, which you know, need, inaccurate uh, for the end of August, you're saying that you wouldn't be able to respond to all of that, assuming that it's even earlier, um, that you could not be ready for the beginning of March 2025. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying I love that discovery deadline. Up. Let's shoot for that. And I think that would help me make a June 2025 trial. I think once we have that discovery, um, and, and I agree, we can file the challenges to the death penalty earlier, but the challenges to some of the things that are going to be contained in discovery, those, we need to see it all and see how it interplays. I can do some things early, but I may be coming back and asking them for it to reconsider if it doesn't go our way and we found something that we didn't have. I think a discovery cutoff is great. And I think the court has to manage that discovery 
if we finally are up to the eve of trial and there ends up being a whole new dump of discovery, then the court has to look at that discovery and understand, is it exculpatory? Is it something that we didn't have a chance to prepare for and should be excluded if it relates to the anything to do with the death penalty portion of the case, then the court's going to be asked to strike the death penalty. I mean, it, the discovery deadline is critical in this case. So I love that. I love that. What that means if I have all the discovery by the end of August this year, it means that there is a stopping point where I can know I have it all. So I can confidently get the motions filed. I can confidently tell my experts, this is it. This is the scope of what you have to do. And I can have some space to read it all and understand it and get ready for witnesses too. If the court makes that deadline, know that mitigation is not going to be done by then. But if the court makes that discovery deadline and then we follow that with our motion practice and then our deadlines for expert disclosures and whatever's going to come from that and our mitigation, we should be in good shape by June of 2025 to try the case. If we have that discovery come up, I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Mr. Thompson? Trying to figure out where to start first. Yes, discovery is fast. Yes, there have been things that uh, Mr. Koberger has asked for that we've inquired, and we were initially told, no, you don't have that. And then uh, we have gone back at the prompting of the defense saying, you sure? I mean, it ought to be there. And for example, x-rays for the autopsy. Well, we just got those. The first came in with thumbnails. In today's discovery, Ms. Taylor is gonna have the full size, which we were able to obtain. We saw, he gave us thumbnails. These are useless. Give us, give us the real thing. Uh, and through the coroner's office, we, we were able to finally achieve that. According to Ms. Jennings, we are better than 95% complete on discovery. Uh, so we're getting close. There are some things that are outstanding. There are some issues with uh, what information is actually available to us. We have given Mr. Koberger everything that we have that we haven't asked for a protective order on or had some sort of dispute about. And we've given it to them, and the, frankly, in the order it's come in, uh, instead of waiting to try to package it together and give it to them in a different format just because they want it as quickly as possible, and I appreciate that, and we're going to continue doing that. Um, we do, it's going to benefit to have deadlines for everybody to have to work for here. Uh, I don't think just setting a deadline for state's discovery does anything other uh, productive other than that initial stage. So if we're going to set discovery deadlines, we need a uh, state's discovery deadline. We need a defense discovery deadline within a reasonable time after that and a reasonable time before trial because we're going to then have to investigate whatever the defense tells us <laughs> they might be using. And then, of course, um, an opportunity after we see what the defense is um, is proposing or is disclosing uh, to rebut that in some fashion and give notice of that. So that package of three days are important. Um, Pre-draw motion on the death penalty. I think that's important. We need deadlines to just get it done and over with. And both teams can prioritize based on the timelines what needs to be done when. I don't know the first thing about what's going on with defenses mitigation. Um, apparently, it's been going on for a while. It sounds like it's going to be massive. Um, that's something that we just don't have any insight to. Um, we, we think that our proposals are realistic. We appreciate the fact that something could happen where it turns out that they aren't realistic, that something happens that we have to revisit. And I think we need to be prepared to do that. Um, I think the last thing that I, I want to touch on real quick is um, the proposal to set a, a state's discovery deadline and set hearings on the change of venue is inadequate. As we've indicated, the change of venue under the law, that motion is premature. We need to have be able to give the court the benefit of what impacts publicity, for example, is having on our actual jury pool. We know there's publicity. Everybody can agree there's been massive publicity, uh, publicity not in just in Wayne County, 
But I see more about it in Boise or hear about it from other parts of the state and what we're seeing locally. Now, so the mass of publicity, that's a red herring, realistically. There's publicity everywhere about this. The issue is whether the publicity and the nature of this case is such that we cannot pick a fair and impartial jury in this county. And, of course, we know that just being aware of publicity about a case does not disqualify a jury. There has to be a showing that that publicity or whatever has impacted the juror to the point where that juror cannot sit in this box as a fair and impartial juror and make a decision based only on the evidence presented in this courtroom. That's the issue that your honor is going to have to decide on the change of venue question. And you can't do that based on a bunch of affidavits from experts who say, judge, there's been a lot of publicity. That doesn't cut it. So I think just having a state's discovery deadline and trying to prematurely move forward with motion for change of venue is not the right approach. We think that the out, uh, the proposals that we've made are reasonable understanding. Ms. Hayward has concerns about whether she's going to be able to meet those. And I think there are enough stages in there that if that becomes a reality, there's the opportunity for us to discuss that. Like everybody here, we only want to do this once. We do not want to invite error that we can avoid. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Can I, you, oh, you, yes, I think you said maybe you're like 98%. On uh, but probably a little bit more than 95%. It's what Ms. Jennings 95. just told me. Okay. Nine, so if it's 95%, I mean, is it possible that it could be done before the end of August? It's possible, and we are going to wait till the end of August to do anything. We will continue to disclose information as we receive it. I mean, that, that's not fair to the defense. That's not fair to anybody. Just sit on stuff and dump it. So we are opt We are hopeful that it will be finished by then, but we don't want to have to face a deadline that we think there's a chance could uh, be difficult to meet. And that's why we propose this, the early September date, which would be essentially six months from now. September 6th, that's what you're saying? Yes, sir. Ms. Taylor, you said that would be fantastic. That would be fantastic, Your Honor. And um, Your Honor can give us a January 2025 deadline if the court wants to set a discovery deadline for us, too. Uh, expert disclosures, I think, maybe would take a little bit longer, maybe February 2025. The court gives us a deadline for expert disclosures. I, I want to comment on the motion for venue change. Your Honor, because I filed a motion and the court doesn't have affidavits or the briefing to understand how we're gonna approach this doesn't make it untimely. I'm fully aware that the massive amount of media coverage by itself isn't all of it. But I'm also aware that this case has had more media coverage than most other cases and it continues. So there is an impact of that. There are other considerations besides just the massive amount of media and an impact on potential jurors. That's what we're going to talk about. I, I think it's timely. I think it's appropriate to set a change of venue motion. I think it is what makes the most sense for the court to make that determination and set a trial date from there. If the court sets one here and has to change it later, a lot of things have gone into play to get that trial date set here, to get the courtroom reserved, and a lot of people rely on that. Waiting until the court has heard the information, more than affidavits saying there's mass amount of media coverage, the court can make that determination. If the court agrees to change venue at that time, then it makes a lot more sense to just set that trial from there. I would think by the end of, or by May, when we can have a hearing, I would think I would have a better handle maybe on the process the state's going through now with its discovery. I will continue to make the utmost effort to get all the way through every piece of what I have now and continue to follow up with questions to the state so that we can try to have this discovery issue put aside. Once we have the discovery completed, I think that we're going to have a lot better idea of what the motion practice is gonna look like and how long that's going to take. And, and it'll be a more realistic way to disclose experts to one another with the materials that's required under Idaho Rule of Evidence 702. 
I, I think that's a better way to go, even though you might not set a trial date today, because at least you'll set one that's really informed that maybe everybody can rely on. Thank you. 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 Well, I'm going to I want to make an informed decision about changing venue, and it makes sense to me. I mean, it may be premature, but uh, I'd like to see what the defense has to say about that, and what you're going to present. Um, so, unless I'm just curious, the gear was. Uh, I can always deny it, um, but if it's uh, if it's sufficiently strong um, and persuasive, then maybe it makes sense to do that. I, you know, obviously, when I mean, for personal reasons, I don't particularly want to go to another county uh, for uh, well, weeks, 14 weeks, uh, if necessary. I mean, we'll do what we need to do, but I'm not, as I sit here, I'm not persuaded that we necessarily have to change it. I think that's an automatic. And there are a lot of factors, and that's one of the reasons why I was looking at this uh, patent case, which is, they, that, that's court of, court of Appeals, but it goes through all of the other uh, cases that have dealt with this issue. Um, so, I'm thinking, uh, you said mid-April that you would be able to file all of your uh, declarations, affidavits, whatever you're going to do, let the state know what, uh, who uh, is going to testify, if you're going to have witnesses to testify, is there going to be experts? We got a taste of that, you know, sometime at the beginning of one of our uh, hearings. So maybe I'll hear the same witness, I don't know. But, um, so we'll say April 17th. Yes, I can make okay. a call. And maybe we say the state has enough time to have their response by May 1st. What do you think? I think that's appropriate, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Because there may be experts on the other side, too. So, and I expect the information that you're going to present both sides and um, with a brief. So, obviously. And I'm going to be in Quincy the next week. You actually have other cases. I'm surprised. How do you feel about uh, afternoon of May 20th? That's a little bit far out, but we've already been, been talking about maybe having a trial starting in June. So. Your Honor, uh, can I have it before May 25th? A witness I anticipate is not going to be available or starting May 25th. May 25th. Starting May 25th, I think for two weeks. So if I could okay. have it ahead of May 25th, that way we so can... have a jury trial that week, May 20th. Okay. Um, this afternoon of May 14, give you enough time, Ms. Beatty? That was May 14th, Your Honor. May 14, that's Tuesday. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we'll say uh, about 1.30. Sounds greater. 
the 130, May 14. I am going to make a determination about that presentation on change of venue before I set the trial. Um, it could be, it could still be March 3rd, or maybe beginning of June. Yeah, that's that's 2024. I know. I'm just I'm just still thinking of 2024. It's hard. It it, it is hard for me to to think it uh, is so far out. Um, but I'm listening carefully to both sides, and it's a complicated case, and it's a death penalty case, and that adds a lot of the really does. So. I'm going to hold, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I would like you to send me uh, your scheduling list and I will think about that. Um, we're going to have a deadline of September 6th for discovery from the state. And Ms. Taylor, could you say beginning of January? Yes. Okay, January, give me a date. Uh, night. Nice. Okay. Good. Good job. All right. And that'll be 2025. Who's baby? Uh, could, could we address one more deadline briefly? Yes, of course. Um, uh, any, you know, any, you give, you all give me deadlines. I'll, okay. I'll write them down. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there's been an ongoing discussion beginning most recently with the state's request for scheduling order, and I believe Ms. Taylor briefly addressed it at the last hearing. There's been an ongoing discussion about the alibi deadline, and the state is asking the court to either limit the defendant to presenting evidence about the disclosure that he made related to the alibi, which was that he was driving around the night of the homicides, uh, but not allowing any further discussion or evidence of an alibi, uh, given the amount of time that has passed since the state requested that uh, alibi disclosure. Um, alternatively, since it was in the court's scheduling order initially prior to the trial getting vacated, we would ask the court to set a 10-day deadline now because that is consistent with the alibi statute. Uh, the state does not believe it is appropriate to tie the alibi to the jury trial date in this case. The statute that sets forth that 10-day timeline is completely separate from Rule 16 and other uh, discovery deadlines through the litigation process. Uh, I think at this point, there has been so much time that has passed, and it has frankly causes the state great alarm that the defense is discussing calling upwards of 400 witnesses during the innocence phase when we don't have, um, potentially don't have a full alibi disclosure. And when you look at, when you look at cases uh, regarding uh, appeals from issues that arise during alibis that come up at, tri at trial, uh, these cases are all defendants appealing a conviction because the state doesn't get a second, a second chance. If the state gets ambushed at trial, that's it for us. Uh, we're asking the court to hold the defendant uh, to a fair alibi deadline, and I think that uh, the time has come. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. B. Well, I, my understanding was, was that was it, but I may be wrong. Ms. Taylor. No. When the court vacated the trial setting, the court vacated all of the deadlines, including the alibi deadline. That wasn't carved out as one that was still held through when the court vacated the rest of its scheduling order. So I don't think that we're foreclosed from that. The court also has the ability to give an extension besides a, the limited time by statute. In this case, it's more than Brian was just driving around. We have let the state and the court know that we expect that that will be supported by expert testimony and by cross-examination of the state's experts. I need their full cast report and the rest of the discovery related to that before I can say more about that. So to tie me to a deadline when I don't have the rest of the discovery that I've been waiting for that would relate to that will mean that I will be back asking the court to reopen it. My expert can't finish until I get the rest of the discovery as well. And the discovery you're talking about is a video of the car? No. I, 
What, what are you? What are you? So the, the video that we talk about is one that I think the state's going to use in its case that I don't have full video on. That I'm not talking about any video of Brian's car. When I'm talking about an alibi defense, what I'm I mean, unless there's video that shows it elsewhere that I haven't gotten to yet, which may be possible given the fact that I, there's a lot I haven't seen yet. What I'm talking about though is the cast report, the drive testing information. Cast uh, report meaning the you know this, identif identification of the particular car. That is the no. cell tower oh, okay. um, information. I'm with you. So what what that is going to show and what the drive testing data is going to show and what other reports related, related to that are going to be things that my expert needs to finish our investigation and things that I need to formulate my cross-examination against the state's expert. So when I'm telling you that I'm going to do those things in alibi, I can't tell you more than that right now, but that's how we're going to support Brian's alibi, that he was out driving that night. Okay, so you're saying that you have not received the cell, the cell tower reports? I have some data, some cell tower data, some phone record data. I have a draft of a CAST report. The most recent information I have, CAST, is the FBI doing their work. The most recent information I have is that on March 31st, they expect for that report to be done through the peer review process. So I may get it a month from now. I need to get it to my expert to digest. There's materials that support their report that I don't have full disclosure of. And the state's aware of it. I think they're working on it. And maybe they're on that drive that I'll pick up today. But I haven't had them yet. So, so you expect to get that in mid-March? I expect to get their report after March 31st after it's done. The supporting data, I'm not sure when it's coming. They tell me it's coming. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it back to the state. Uh, Your Honor, I, I guess I'm a little confused because if- Well, I, I am, obviously I am too, so okay. okay. I'm confused because if the defendant's alibi is that he was out driving around that night, I'm not sure what additional information his cell data could add to, to an actual alibi defense. It seems like what the defense is asking for, and they're being completely upfront about it, and I, I appreciate that, but what they're asking to do is essentially double-check all the discovery before disclosing their alibi, and that's not what the purpose of an alibi deadline is. In fact, it's quite the opposite. There is case law that describes that given the ease with which an individual could fabricate an alibi, and certainly that's not what the state is accusing the defendant of doing. I'm using language that is in case law, though. Given the ease with which an individual can fabricate an alibi, that is a very legitimate deadline. It's, it's, it's a reasonable deadline. It's a reasonable demand of the litigation process. There is a reason why there is a 10-day deadline in the statute, and that is because the defendant is able to tell his counsel where he was that night. They can work together and formulate a defense, and they can disclose an alibi. That is the whole purpose of an alibi deadline. The state has complied with the discovery up to this point. We will continue to comply with discovery. We are disclosing everything that we have to the defense when we get it, unless there's some protective order issue. We are asking that the court hold the defense to a fair standard that has been set forth in this statute and that is constitutional under the United States Constitution and the Idaho's Constitution that has been repeatedly upheld um, by the United States Supreme Court and the Idaho Supreme Court. Thank you. Okay. I maybe dropped the ball, but went through the cracks that I didn't. I guess what I I interpreted that as that was it for um, what we were going to hear about where he was and how uh, he was established. Uh, you know the evidence that he was in a particular place. So. Uh, once again, trying to be uh, compromising, I'm going to give you until April 17th. And you can submit uh, the other information that you're going to find for uh, And that should be plenty of time because you're going to get some additional information from FBI apparently by the end of March. And uh, we can talk more about that later at the hearing on. 
we should go change the So that gives you some cushion. I'm not going to set it for you know, 10, uh, 10 more days, but uh, I am sending it that thing. And the reason for that is so we don't have an ambush at the trial. I mean, that's why that's why that is uh, established as a law. Okay. Um, well, I think we've gotten somewhere. Uh, I and is there anything else we need to address today, Mr. Thompson? I don't believe so, Judge. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Taylor? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you all. We are here. That's the latest from the courtroom. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts. You don't miss any of our continuing coverage on the case against Brian Koberger. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. This has been a special report from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Want to listen ad-free? Want advanced access to all of our interviews before anyone else? Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. You get every episode commercial free. So you can binge on True Crime. Until you can binge no more. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts now. Or go to our podcast page and sign up now. More of the Hidden Killers podcast next.